This is the Cliff Yates Show. Personal growth, motivation, inspiration, and philosophies for a great life. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Cliff Yates Show. As always, you are in the right place. And I have such a special guest with me today. Well, he's my good friend. And I really want to get right to the heart of the testimony. Uh, <laughs> pun intended. And you'll know why in a second. But uh, I want to get right to this testimony and not put it off because uh, this is the way we have titled it. So I want to get right to it. I don't want to be one of those people who don't get to the meat of the matter. But how about a little background? This young man and I have been friends for probably over 40, 45 years. Uh, my dad hired him as a police officer back in 1976. I was one year out of high school. And so uh, my little hometown village police department, my dad's chief of police and his, his patrolman is my good friend that's here today. And then I later came on to join the, uh, the Livingston County Sheriff's Department. We got to work together in the same county, he for the village of Caledonia and me for the for the county sheriff's department he later went on to a long career with the monroe county sheriff's department and uh, retired from monroe county sheriff's department in rochester new york uh he then made a, actually made a run for sheriff uh he worked organized crime uh he worked uh, high crime in uh, monroe county in the meantime he had quite a, a a health challenge that he has overcome and i think he wants to uh, maybe relate that to his faith and so i'll bring him right on tom basile thank you for joining me my brother clef thank you for having me i really appreciate it well it's great and how did the um let's start with the with the health health uh, challenge here you 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 had some heart uh, failure right and how did that start well it started out with a what they called an event which happened about 12 years ago okay and uh the doctor monitored me for a while i was on medication and i had strict heart failure that wow. just over the years got worse. Uh, it got so worse that the medication wouldn't take care of it anymore. So they had to give me a transplant and I was, uh, <laughs> I was just totally surprised when they mentioned that to me because I, I was 68 years old then, I'm 69 now, but uh, I was just totally blown away because I didn't know that they could do that with an older person. I thought yeah. that was something that they could do with a younger person. So. Uh, we went through all kinds of tests and uh, all that type of things that summertime. It was in 2023. And uh, by the way, my wife was with me every step of the way, my wife, Debbie. St. Debbie. Uh, she, Some people call her St. Debbie <laughs> because yeah, I know they, she's here today and she's, yes, uh, they do. she's a saint for uh, being there by your side the whole yeah, way. So was. absolutely. Yeah, she was. And it was uh, it was a season for the times. I mean, we we had no idea that this was going to happen. And um, and I just have to tell you that the Lord spoke to us in the beginning yeah. and just told us that, look, everything's going to be all right. And sometimes when that happens, when the Lord speaks to your heart, you just feel that maybe it was in your own brain. But my wife kind of confirmed it two months later by sending me a, uh, a, a song that she saw. Yeah, It was a brand new song called Everything's Going to Be All Right. And it was, it's a worship song, and uh, that's what really uh, that's what really kind of c cemented that in my head that I was I was being protected by the Almighty God. Yeah, and you felt that. I know you relayed that you you felt. Or did you hear? You, you felt it. Put it on your heart. Everything's going to be all right. And then the song it came about it. and confirmed that. Yeah, yeah, it confirmed it. You're right. Let's go back a little bit because I remember you telling me that. You, your doctor, you told him, he, he, he broached this to you, and you said, well, I feel great, so what if I do nothing? And what did he tell you? Well, if you do nothing. Yeah, you he told me if you do nothing, you'll be dead in six months. And, and he, was, he was correct, because I had a friend of mine who was also a deputy sheriff in Monroe County, and he got the same thing. And he talked with me. He asked me if I went through what I went through was worth it, and I told him, sure it was. You know, it was what I was yeah, supposed to yeah. do and try and obey God, too. And uh, he didn't want a new heart. He just didn't want to go through it. Yeah. And he died in six months. Oh, my God. In six months he died. So uh, the, the doctor was right on with that, and we, and, and we knew it. So. And so, and, and, and the, you know, to, to the point is, you didn't have a heart attack, and you're, you're taken to the hospital. This, this is a, you had heart trouble. You were taking medication. I think you had a uh, pacemaker. And you're feeling great. And then your doctor comes with this news. And so, I mean, it, 
it doesn't get really real until he says, no, if you do nothing, you're going to be dead in uh, uh, two years. Yes, he had me on the operating table on, uh, in February 2023 to take a, uh, a, it's some kind of a scope thing yeah. that determines how much blood your heart is beating and uh, to the rest of your body. And at that point in time, it was steady at about 22%. The normal heart, a healthy heart, pumps around 55 to 60 percent of your blood to the rest of your organs and we all know that the blood carries the life and uh, carries the oxygen and it's important for the rest of your you know the rest of your lungs and the rest of in your lungs your kidneys your liver everything works off that blood yeah and mine was only only pushing 22 percent and it would never get any better and that's what, what his key was. It's never going to get any better. Well, let's and let's go and, and we're going to do it like a movie, right? We're going to give you the ending right now. Then we're going to go back. So the ending is right now, post heart transplant, nine months. You're at what? How much percentage? I'm at 60 percent. That's just amazing. 60%. So you're at what your heart should be doing. Yes. And it's doing its job. Yeah. And it's an old, only a 40 year old heart, too. Wow. So I. I pray for the family of the person that gave that heart every single day. Yeah. And hopefully we'll be hoping uh, to, to connect with them someday just to tell them thank you and to yeah. their face. So now this gets real when the doctor tells you, you know, and it, you'll be dead in a year. So now what is the process? You're going to be on a list or how, how does that work where you're going to have a heart transplant? <clears throat> well, first they have to send you through all kinds of tests uh, for your entire body. Uh, even as far as I had to have a tooth pulled because it had a little bit of a, a cavity in it. And uh, I asked them, I said, can I have it filled? And they said, no, we want it totally out of your body. And we want everything else out of your body that doesn't belong. So they sent me through all these tests and I was strong enough. And it came to the point in October of 2023 that I got a call. And the nurses called me from down there and they said, uh, we're ready for you. And any time that you can come down within the next couple of weeks, we'd appreciate that. So that's what started the whole thing, and it happened so fast. We didn't even have time to think about it. And I, I'm asking a question to, to, because sometimes they say, and I don't know if this even had any relation, that, you know, keep your, uh, your, your gums and your teeth healthy because it actually relates to the heart. Did that have anything to do with that? You had to have a healthy... Yes. Not, that, yeah. My, uh, in fact, I just went to the dentist a couple of days ago. And he said, they told you that, right? And I said, yes, they did, because that has a lot to do with your heart. Yeah. And my heart was just too gone, too far gone. Yeah, you had to have the Yeah, there wasn't any way we were going to save it. Now, I think you were telling me, so uh, there's criteria, right, as to where you might fall on the list. So you have to be, you know, for you to be on the uh, need it now point of the list, or and if you're not, so you have to kind of, you know, be concerned of where you fall based on your test results? or Right. Well, in the beginning, and you know, Rochester General Hospital has an affiliation with uh, New York University Hospital, and that's where they do all the transplants. So my wife and I had to go down in August to meet the team that takes care of all this, the nurses, the doctors, the whole oh, span. Man, yeah. And uh, they were very, very, very good. And they were the doctor mostly. Uh, I mean, you know how sometimes you can get a doctor that's a little bit rough around the edges yeah that side this, manner missing yeah, yeah. <laughs> this guy was just fantastic and he was just uh mozavi was his name and he came in the room when uh he came to miss to visit debbie and i and said i got a cup of coffee here is that okay can i drink my coffee and i says yeah i'm a coffee guy too yeah and he sat in front of me and he put his hand on my knee and he said we're going to make you part of our family and we're going to take wow. care of you and i don't want anything to bother you i don't want anything to make you make you feel bad yeah and uh, they did I mean he he and his plan was I was number four on the list there's a, a list of six items I was number four because I was healthy enough to move around yeah as long as I was taking a certain medication and he says we want to get you in the hospital take that medication away from you and your heart's not going to be able to withstand that so we'll give you a pump and we'll put you on an impeller they call it that raised me up to number two, okay. Because I was in the hospital, couldn't leave. Can't leave the hospital, and so I can't can't leave the pump behind yeah. anymore. So that made me put me higher up on the list, 
And uh, we just waited. And uh, I was just blessed that uh, after, well, we had two false alarms. Uh, one heart that they got was just, uh, they were, they hit it. It was an overdose and they hit the heart too much with prods. Ah. And, uh, and, and they ruined the heart that way. And then the second one was a homicide. And they took his heart out, and it was the valves were just no good. Okay. So he wanted to get me a perfect heart, and he used to come in every single morning into my into my room, and just encourage me. Yeah, and say, you know, we're getting a lot of calls on you, but we're not seeing the most perfect heart gotcha. at this point. And he said, I want to give you a perfect heart, so you'll never have to come back. Wow. Here. Yeah. And that was just amazing. And he did. Yeah. He finally did, the third time around. Yeah, he he came in and said they had a, they found a heart down in North Carolina. They sent a team down there to extract the heart to see if if it was okay. And they called him back and said it's fine, but you have to get him down to the operating room immediately. So they brought me down, and it was like four o'clock in the afternoon. And the minute I hit the elevator, I said goodbye to my wife. And the minute I hit the elevator, I don't remember what happened after yeah. that. And I was out for three days. So Jeez. the person that took the brunt of that worse was my wife. Yeah, St. Debbie. Yeah. And so Saint so Debbie. you're in New York, and so this heart was in Virginia? Or? Uh, North Carolina. North Carolina. So yeah. they, they go to North Carolina. They take the heart out, and then they report to New York, we, it's a go. We got a perfect heart. Get them ready. Yes. And now they wheel you down to the operating room. Right. So in the meantime, before this, I don't get it. The So your heart... You're on the, uh, what do they call it, impeller, the pump. Yep. yep. Is your heart still in your body? Or? Yes. Yeah. Okay. They, they insert the impeller into your heart to do the work that your heart should be doing. Okay. And it was pumping the blood at a normal rate, and I had to have that. Uh, believe me, there were mornings and nights where I thought of just taking the pump with me and going, getting the bus and going <laughs> home <laughs> because it was rough. Yeah, it, it was really yeah. rough waiting, and uh, I tried the best I can to put all my faith yeah. in God. And you know, for some reason, I just felt like He was going to take care of me, but it was just lagging on and on and on. And He was waiting for the perfect heart, and that's just exactly yeah. what they got. Was the but there was heart. two before two, yeah. so one had two. been hit too many heart, too many times, too, too many times with the prods. Yeah, and then uh, the second one was a homicide, and his valves were no good. Gotcha. Okay, the valves. Yeah, and the third one was perfect. Perfect. My God, my, my blood type, my actually the same size as my my heart itself. Wow. And uh, it the gentleman there that donated the heart had to be close to my size too. So okay. So they knew it was going to work perfectly. And uh, so you got to New York City to this to this uh, this place in New York City. I guess is quite. This is this is all they do is heart transplants in this part of is it NYU? All or? they do is transplants. It's New York okay. University. NYU. Langone. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And that's all they do is transplants of every kind. And they also do cr uh, uh, cancer treatment. And they've been very successful with cancer treatment too, from what I understand. But it's a it's like a little city. And the part that I was in at the ICU was a brand new building that they just opened up in 2015, and it was just state of, state, state of the, of the art. art. Yeah, state of the art. There was I can control everything from my bed. Yeah, the heat, the lights, and a 75 inch screen TV. And you could see this. I think you said the uh, Empire State Empire Building. Empire State Building. Out of one win, one one wall was glass. Yeah, we could see the Empire State Building, and the other wall that was glass, we could see the East River. So we can watch the helicopters coming in and yeah. out and doing all that. I'm only laughing because I remember you saying, that was, that was great for about 24 hours. Then yeah, get me home. I'm, I'm out of here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then I, then I, was, I was dreaming about looking out my backyard. And That's the view you wanted, that. right, everybody? That's, <laughs> he wanted his home view is what he yeah, wanted. Absolutely. What's the time frame between you getting to New York City and, this, and, and you getting the perfect heart? Because you had the two in between. Are we talking weeks? Yeah. Or? Well, no. I, I, yeah, weeks. I went in on October 3rd. And I was there, and uh, November 21st is when I got the heart, okay. when I had the operation. Ah, November 23rd. So it was a good six weeks. Yeah. A good six weeks. Wow, okay. Being, being tied up in the hospital for six weeks was like Ooh. <laughs> spending time in jail. Yeah, really right? Was. The nurses were just fantastic. Yeah. They, were just, they were just awesome. They were like little angels. They really yeah. were. 
and they would they see that you were getting down and stuff like that. They come in and give you a little bit of, you know, a little bit of encouragement. Ask me oh. one nurse that got me a, a pizza on Sunday yeah. for the football game oh and everything my God. else. And yeah, they were just great. They were just awesome. So you, they're looking at your mental state and your, in yes, your wow. Yeah, they do that too. Yeah, and, they, and they make sure that they cover everything. I mean, Oh, they, my God. And they're there 24-7, and they, you know, they do 12-hour shifts there too, the nurses. Yeah. And they're there for 12 hours, and they're Jeez. just amazing. It's amazing, amazing human beings. They really are. So a lot of things came together that you didn't plan on, right? You, had, you, you ended up with a relationship with uh, someone involved in a big food company through your son who worked for him, right? And you just happened yes. to be telling testimony, telling your, your story. And how did he step in as a... As a yeah, and I, a, I actually met him directly through a meeting that we had with the chapel seat because we were looking for donations and all that type of thing. You were already a chaplain... And I was already for the Rochester for, for for a Flower City right. chaplaincy. Okay, right. through Cavalry Church in Rochester, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah, and uh, we went up to visit him a couple of different times, and the last time, he he knew my story that I'm going to have to go to New York City yeah. and have a heart transplant, and he he was a good brother in Christ, and uh, he asked me what he could do for me, and I said, well. You got to pray for me. That's all. Yeah, I'm, I'm yeah. just asking for prayer. That that's the best thing you can do. Yeah. And he says, "Well, how are you getting there?" And I said, ah, "I don't know." I says, "You know, f- flying is really expensive now, and we're trying to hold on to money as we went along." Yeah. And uh, <laughs> he says, "Well, why don't you you want to take my plane?" And he said, "Plane." Yeah. And I said, "This." This is unbelievable, and I didn't believe it. I almost fell off the chair. Are you thinking little Cessna or yeah, something? Yeah, that's what I'm thinking about. <laughs> and then when I, I got home that night, I called my son, and I asked my son. I says, you know, Kip's got a plane. What's it look like? He says, Dad, that's not a plane. It's a, uh, it's a, it's a corporate jet. jet. Oh, my that, God, that's yeah, great. Yeah, that flies like 10 or 12 people yeah. at once. And they did. He made, the, he made the plane available to me, and I took the flight to yeah. uh, New York. And I it thought was it was amazing that he said, I'm going to have my pilots on standby. So when you give the yeah, call, yeah, they're ready to did. go. And then you wonder, was that really going to happen? I, no, I called him. I called him on the phone. It was his brother-in-law. And his brother-in-law is the head pilot. And oh, he's great. got a co-pilot. And he says, that's great. He says, what time do you want to meet? Jeez. He says, when do you want to go? And I says, well, this was on Thursday. I was talking to him. I says, I'm planning on Monday, you know, the 2nd or 3rd of October it was. And he says, okay, what time? And I says, well, 9.30 would be okay. I yeah. said, so I could get a little sleep. <laughs> and he says, we'll have everything ready for 9.30. He All said, right. no problem. And they were just fantastic. They really were. I mean, it was it was just something from God. It was yeah. God followed us through the entire oh. thing. And he never he never gave up on us at all. There was, um, there was a... Um, who was it? Was it a nurse or someone who came in? It, 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 you guys would, would pray, pray together or you, you would... A certain yeah, it's uh, it was the oxygen guy. He was the okay. CO two guy, and I they discovered one night I was laying on my back and they didn't put me up high enough that I they thought I had uh, uh, that sleep apnea. Oh yeah yeah yeah, and sleep apnea. Yeah, yeah. My, my oxygen went down to about sixty six, oh, and the alarms went off, and they came in. They were oh man, they were worried, and then they hooked me up with the uh, CPAP. Oh, yeah, yeah, and yeah. And the guy to come in and do the CPAP was this guy, Teddy, my friend Teddy. And uh, we started talking about God. And then after every night after that, he'd come in and we'd have a little bit of Bible study. And oh, that's so great. About God. Yeah. yeah, and my, my, when my wife finally came up, the three of us used to sit there and talk about God with the Bible and all that. And we became very good friends. Yeah. And we, we even are connected nowadays where we text wow. each other back and forth. But there was a time, right, during that time where you were like, still, are you there, God? Are you, are you there? I know you were asking, and you were like, there was, a, there was a, some verse, some scripture that you relied upon when, when, when you were asking yourself that question, if, if he was there. Yeah, I started reading the Psalms. The Psalms, the that's Psalms right. The yeah. Psalms really, would really settle in my heart, and I got to Psalm 20. Psalm 20 is about a multi- multitude of people praying for him, and ah. I knew that was happening for me. That was a psalm of David. This is David. Okay, yeah, yeah. David. And he, he had, I guess they have a, 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 a rule during a war that everybody has to pray before they go out to battle, dating back to David's time. Wow. And they used to have a multitude of people praying for them. And uh, I know 
of at least three churches that I w- were praying for me. I had a mission from uh, Africa, I believe. They were praying for me. And uh, there was a few other people and a few other organizations that were praying. But I, I could get up in the morning, and i wake up in the morning, and I'd, I'd, I'd start crying and thinking, I'm still here. Yeah. And nothing's happening, Lord. Yeah. And I told the Lord right straight directly, you know, I read these things in your word that you've got promises and you're going to keep them through. Yeah. And I'm waiting for something. I haven't heard anything. Yet. Yeah. No, this is when you're waiting for that, uh, the, heart, for the, the heart, third heart. time, right? Or no, this was from just the, the first, first time. Oh, yeah. man. Okay. Yeah. So he, uh, and then when we had the mistakes, I thought, okay, somebody's playing games here, you know? Yeah. But the key was perfect. Was, was the word perfect. perfect yeah god said he would get me a perfect heart and when the yeah. doctor came in the third time and said i have the perfect heart he actually used those words yeah and i thought okay this is a gift from god this yeah. is what he promised yeah. you know now you did tell him right because he came in i think we have a heart i think you told him get out you leave the yeah. room don't come back until you got a perfect heart right yeah because he says i think we got a heart and i says no no with all due respect don't think i want yeah. you to know so yeah. come back when you tell me that you yeah. know you got a heart yeah and he did he was yeah. gone for a couple of hours and yeah then when he came back he says i just got a call from my team and this heart is perfect he said, yeah that word perfect god and it was said, okay all right that's ah. good yeah and i i, I I would be lying to you if sitting here right now to tell you that I wasn't scared. Because of course not, yeah. And it's something that one pastor told me that I know why you're scared because it's not natural. That's it's right. It's not natural yeah. that you would have this done because everybody's got their own organs and they keep them until you die. That's right, yeah. You know? It's not natural. And it's not natural. Yeah. <laughs> and then I, it never really dawned on me until we got home and I would sit at the table at night and really think about, I've got somebody else's heart yeah. in my chest. I know it. And, uh, you know, God has chosen to take one person and leave the other. And, and it's just... It shows the sovereignty of God and, yeah. and how he really controls everything. Yeah. It's just amazing. That's right. I'm, I'm thinking when you say that, right, because I know you're scared because it's not natural, but, and so, I mean, uh, when Jesus, who is, uh, you know, getting crucified and he calls out, Father, why have you forsaken me? Well, he's feeling human, human emotions, right? right? So even he, Absolutely. who's got in human form, is feeling human emotions. So we can't really beat ourselves up for being human. That's right. In our, in our own uh, in the fleshly body, right. but your spirit is what spirit takes you through. Holds on. It yeah. holds on. Spirit holds on. Holds and holds never on. lets go. Right. Right. Never. Yeah. Never. And he never lets go of us. And yeah. I know Jesus was right by my side, side there all the time. Yeah. While I was there, that's what makes it so amazing to me, because it's got nothing to do with me. Yeah. It's got nothing to do with what was wrong with me or anything else. This was all God. This was all Jesus Christ. Yeah. That brought me through this and showed his glory to other people around me yeah through, that. through through you absolutely yeah and why he used me i have no idea i'm sure someday i'll be able to ask him but uh that really doesn't make a difference at this point it's no. it's an example to everybody that if you really trust him and you pray and yeah. people pray i mean these people were just busting down the doors to heaven and yeah. wanting everything to be okay and, and I mean, especially our home church was just, yeah. I mean, the pastor every single day had something to say about it. And even, even the pastors from the church, they were out riding yeah. around one day, decided to go to New York City and they Jeez. came to visit. Yeah, me. they just happened to be driving around yeah. a six hour drive <laughs> down to say, we're just in the neighborhood, Tom. Yeah, they came to visit me and that was, that was really a joyous time too. But uh, all, through the whole thing, I had such a new profound relationship with God and he has given me the ability to have profound relationship with my wife yes because that's been increased also yeah and it's, you know I'm, I'm just so thankful and I'll never be not thankful the rest of my life yeah that all this has happened and it's yeah. just amazing the yeah. amazing amazing grace that God has amazing yeah I had another thought for you but I left it left my head uh let's go to the so like post-op, what happens, you, you, you come out of surgery and you awaken in your room, or how does that happen? Come out of surgery, I was three days under. Okay, three uh, days. Three days under medication. Uh, they had me hooked up to a dialysis machine because your kidneys can't go for very long without oxygen. Yeah. And usually it, when you have a heart 
transplant, the kidneys take a little bit of a hit. 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 Okay, yeah. Uh, so I was out for three days, and my wife and the nurses were there 24-7, and they just did a phenomenal job yeah. taking care of it. Uh, one thing that the doctor told me before I had the operation, I asked him, I said, what starts the heart f- pumping? Yeah. What? New heart. Yeah. And uh, he says, that is the key. He says, I've done over 1,500 heart transplants. And he says, that is the most miraculous thing I've ever seen. He says, when we hook up all your arteries and, and, and veins and all that after yeah. we put the new heart in, and then we take the clamps off the machine, and the blood starts flowing through your your veins, the minute it hits the heart, the heart starts beating on its own. Wow. He says it's just something that science can't explain. They don't even know why. No, they can't they explain no this. No, they have no idea. And we know that it's because there's life is in the blood. Yeah, life is in the and blood. Jesus told us that. Yeah. And it, it's just uh, it, it's just unexplainable by them. They yeah. can't explain it, so they don't really talk about it sometimes. No. I, I I can't believe he's done fifteen hundred himself. Well, with that with that hospital, with that te- but that's with that all hospital. he does. Yeah, that's all he does. He doesn't do anything else. So the the hours before the transplant, he come in the hall, he come in the room, and he talked to Debbie and I, and he said, um, "I'm not going to be here for the whole operation." What? And now oh I'm starting God. to spaz a little bit. Yeah, he says because it's Thanksgiving, it's the only time I get to see my kids. So he says, I'll be leaving early, but I'm going to put you in the hands of Dr. Smith. Smith was just great. I mean, he was yeah. very intelligent. He's the one to put the the uh, the impella in, in my heart. Yeah. And he did that operation and uh, just came out fine. He came out Oh, my God. Fine. Yeah. Is, that, is he, his team together all the time doing yeah. these? Yeah. They do it all together all the time. All together. How many is that? Like a team of like 10 or there something? Two main doctors, and then there's probably like eight or 10 other doctors and nurses. And they've got everything down pat. I mean, everybody's got a specific job to do. If he's done 1,500, that's just one surgeon. They must do a lot of heart transplants yeah, throughout do. the year. I mean, they do. They have a very liberal. Um, policy when it comes to selecting other hearts yeah when, and the dis- difference is, is other hospitals may have a little bit more of a conservative view on gotcha that. yeah but they will take a heart that has hepatitis c because there is a um, you know there's a a medication for that now and, it, and it's treatable uh, i have a friend of mine that had a heart done a guy that i was ministering to and he had hepatitis when he got done, and they treated it. Was gone in eight days. Wow! Yeah, so, uh, they're a little bit more liberal. Yeah, because they know they we can treat that. That's not as yeah. much. That's not as important as getting you a heart. And the other thing they I asked them was about uh, HIV. I said, "What if the yeah. donor had HIV?" And they said, "There's, there's no need to worry about that because HIV doesn't oh. settle in the heart. Gotcha. It's only in the blood. It doesn't settle in the heart. Only in the blood. Yeah." So and then, yeah. what happens to your to your other heart? It's not. I think they do some type of research on. Oh it. yeah, I have they no use idea it. What they yeah, do. they can have that. They can have the the uh, defibrillator. Everything they can have all that stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so the number one, what's the number one worry? Rejection of the body for that, or yes, the, with the heart being rejected, the body rejecting the heart. Uh, the immune system is depressed a little bit because of the medication that I take. But I'm always going to have to be on uh, rejection medication. I have two different DNAs. Yeah, There's that's one amazing. One for my heart and one for Jeez. my blood. And that's how they keep track of whether or not it's rejecting. They check the DNAs, DNAs. and they make sure that the heart DNA doesn't override my DNA. And that's how they can tell that. And so far, it's been perfect. It's been 100%. So it's on purpose, they diminish. The, not diminish, uh, reduce the power of the immune system because the body's probably going to say this is a foreign something in my body and I want to fight it and get rid of it. Right. So if and we reduce that. Rejection. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And then, but in the meantime, you got to be careful not to get something else. Right. Wow. Yeah, and then, and she 
early on, my doctor said, you got to be really careful. Yeah. I had to wear a mask for a while going to church and going to events and stuff like that. Yeah. Certain places I, I avoided to go, like to funeral parlors, because everybody kind of hugs each other and everything, which is good. Yeah. But I just couldn't do that at that point in time. So. And so you're walk, walking around with a mask and you had to say, I'm not a liberal. I had a heart transplant. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Don't take this the I wrong listen. way. I got I got rid of the mask real quick. Real quick. Okay. <laughs> so gradually they uh, kind of wean you off some of this medication so that your immune system kind of ramps up a little bit, like slowly. Yes. Or, yeah. Yeah, they do. And it, it's it's at nine months now, and my present doctor now told me that, uh, you know, within a year, your heart okay. will be settled and will your body will be used to it. Yeah. And then you'll only have to be on the one rejection pill and that'll be the answer. oh that'll be great yeah, yeah so did you ever get anything like a cold or flu that was a i got scare? a stomach virus stomach virus a normal stomach virus that lasted about three days with a normal person i carried that with me for six weeks oh my god and it was treacherous and that's oh. i lost like 20 pounds while i was doing that jeez overall i lost this like 60 pounds from the whole thing yeah it was just treacherous it was it was uh, i couldn't eat anything Oh, I didn't no. want to eat. I didn't have an appetite no. or anything like that. So. so when you're in the hospital now, you're post-surgery. What's the rehab? When does it start and what is it? Rehab is just trying to get your body back in shape from laying in bed for so yeah, long. Yeah, because you're atrophying, right? How many, Your muscles all right. shut down. Everything and, all shut down and no, nothing was, I had no strength. I had to walk with a walker. And then when I got home, I got rid of the walker probably after about two weeks. But... Um, <laughs> the recovery was just miraculous. Yeah. Um, you know, we talk about miracles, but these physical therapy people were coming over the house and they were saying, you don't need physical therapy wow. anymore. I mean, you're walking on your own, you're doing all your own thing. And uh, they used to start, they were starting to sign off on me after a couple of weeks. Yeah. And I, I think I went to church once with a walker and that was it. The rest oh of the God. time was fine. Jeez. So and then you have to you get to get your balance back too. Yeah, my balance is just starting to come back too. So yeah, and so you you know you had worked out pretty religiously when you were younger yeah. and the weights and you had a little bit of knowledge of you know muscle memory and growth. Were you a little shocked at how weak your body became pretty yeah. quickly? I was really shocked. Yeah, I mean it, just just laying in bed for two weeks it doesn't take I, long. Know, huh? Just two weeks. Yeah, you start losing. They tried to walk me as usually once a day as much as possible. Because if doctors told me walk as much as you can before the operation. Oh, okay, before. So that, yeah, right. so that you have enough strength to be able to get through. To kind walk. of a build up. Of, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I did. I went for a walk once, maybe twice a day, but I had to have an entourage come with me. Because you I had was, a, did you have like a pole and I, walking around with? It? I had IVs. Oh, you had the I had pump. The pump too, and the pump. You know, I had to have almost two nurses pushing the pump. You know. You got to tell the team was, we're going for a walk, everybody. <laughs> what? We don't have enough people yeah. right now. Yeah. <laughs> And so yeah. uh, they get you up right away then, right? You're on your feet like yeah. the next day? Or? Yeah, well, the, the next day they got me up, but I wow. was still sleeping. Yeah. And uh, the, the third day... What do you day mean you're still sleeping? Were you not even awake and they were getting no, you up? No, I wasn't. I was still medicated real heavily. Oh, but they are, they're moving you and trying to stand you up, and you're like not even not conscious even of this. There, no. And then oh. the third day in the, in the ICU, uh, when I first woke up, I was in the chair. Yeah, and I can remember people talking around me, and then I remember waking up and having all these tubes coming out of me. Oh they God! Have, they have to drain. They have three tubes in your stomach. They have to drain. Yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, feeding tube, uh, breathing tube. They already took out, but uh, yeah, that was like, it was really a surprise to me because I don't even remember the f the prior things that happened. And uh, once I got up. Then I started, then they started walking me around. Yeah. And I, like after the operation, I was only there left in the ICU for 10, for eight days. Wow. After the eighth day, they sent me over to physical therapy. And boy, oh. they beat me up over there too. <laughs> so there, really it's pretty, it's pretty uh, intense that. The physical therapy yeah. is. What yeah. are they doing? What kind of exercises? Well, are they, they first, they, uh, they make, they make you give them measurements of their steps when you're home oh so you have to give them like that. your gait how long your gait is yeah how long oh. your, how high your steps are and all that type of thing oh. so they try to train you on getting up and down those stairs oh. uh, sitting on a bicycle and and you know 
doing the bicycle and all that, and they walk you up and down the si- up and down the hallway. I mean, the most of it's just walking you up and down the hallway. Wow. And it, it worked out well because I was only there for 10 days. Yeah. And then they discharged me. Yeah. And then we had to stay in New York for four days after that at a hotel. And uh, poor Debbie, again, she had to carry all the stuff we had. You can't carry You got a walker. You can't. Yeah, you have no help. Anything. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I just couldn't do anything. No. And uh, we finally had a friend of mine that come down two other times, him and his wife, to visit me. And he... Uh, they came to pick me up and to pick us up Jeez. and they met with us and they picked us up. We got in the car and we drove home and uh, I couldn't fly home. They wouldn't let me fly. No. So he, he yeah. drove us home and just to get home, we got home on the 15th. It was on a Friday. Yeah. This is December, right? December. December. Yeah. yeah. And it was just a wonderful joy to yeah. get home and just go in the living room oh. and sit in my chair and then I just sat there yeah. for hours and I just thought, Man, oh man, this is great. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and uh, kind of a nice time to be. I mean, Christmas, if you if you relate that to the birth of Christ and and yeah, your your faith got you through this. So, yep. it kind of yeah. a beautiful time it to be was. recovering. Yeah, yeah. And I I had a granddaughter that was born That's on my right. birthday oh my in God, December. Yeah, fourth on your birthday. On your birthday, granddaughter's I born. Hadn't seen her yet. So wow. We we got together with them for Christmas time and it was just a great thing. Yeah. It was just an awesome thing. How often how what's the testing process uh, as you go along? Uh, like is it a daily thing? They're checking someone's checking with you. How about the rejection every day? is it blood daily or no? It was it started out to be blood once a week. Okay, once a week. And All right. The doctor used to analyze that. Anything you were you. supposed to watch out for rejection like hey, let me know if this happens or no or No, what happened was is my Kidney started go south. Oh, your kidneys, that's right. I went dehydrated when I was sick. When yeah. I had that uh, virus. And I had to start drinking four or five bottles of water a day. Oh, man. And that's that's pretty rough for a guy. I mean, I drink water, but I didn't know. Not drink like that. that <laughs> no way. I'm with you, man. I... My doctor here at Rochester General, she's been just wonderful. I mean, she yeah. gave me her, she, she gave her, us her phone number, her cell phone number, and we've talked with her any time of day or night. Yeah. And she answers questions and stays on top of everything. Yes, man. There's a, she's got me down now to where I only see her once every two months, and I yeah. I don't have to give blood, but once a month, which is okay. a good thing. And then that DNA tells mm-hmm. them how if there's any rejection or anything. Right, yeah. Initially, she had to take three actual biopsies. Oh, like, of your... She, she'd go in my neck here, and she'd actually go inside my heart and plick, cl- pluck three different cells out of my yeah out of my heart just cells and they checked it that way yeah, yeah. wow yeah. that was amazing it's just amazing i mean i was actually watching it on a monitor you're watching them do it or afterwards yeah i was watching them do it well, because they won't give you an anesthetic to put you to sleep she gave me some things to relax me and then she used to give me a, a i think they call it lidocaine yeah lidocaine 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 and that that freezes the area here. Okay. So she can. I bet it's lidocaine. I think it is. It's lidocaine. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so it was that, but that must have been a choice, right? Do you want to watch this? Because I probably wouldn't want to watch it. No, she told me. She says, "Look at it." You know, oh. they, they covered up my head so that yeah. she can work on it. And then she says, "Look at the monitor over there, and you can see where I'm going with this." Oh shoot! Yeah, she was great. It really was. Oh my! God. She was just awesome. With what it. do you see? Like a little, like a little needle going in and sucking yeah. a yeah. cell, or yeah. yeah. And it, like, wow! It's like a little tube that goes in, and like a little snake, pick, yeah, picks a piece of the cell and then brings it back out. And they and analyze it. Happens it. really quick because she says, "I'm, I'm, I got one more to take out." And there's three of them she's got to take, and the first two I didn't even feel. Oh my god! Uh, yeah, yeah, it it, it 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 worked really quick, and she was really Jeez. good about it. So now we're nine months post, and you're up here at the island with us, and. Yeah. Uh, in your, you feel good and comfortable? Or is there any ever any anxiety in the middle of the night or anything, or panic or nothing? No anxiety, no panic. I've never had any pain in my chest whatsoever. Never. Never any never pain in your any, chest? No. God has saved me from anything that had to do with that. Wow. Uh, but some little small things that might happen every once in a while, but the fact of the matter is, is that, you know, the I take pills, but it, it's just been really a great great 
yeah. positive ride, and he's just taking care of everything. Yeah. My kidneys are back to normal now. Oh, good. And uh, I've actually, the last, the last blood type that I took was on Wednesday, blood test, and the, the results came back showing that uh, my kidneys were back to normal the way they were when I went into the hospital. Wow. Yeah, before the tramp. But now the there was, plan. when the kidneys started going south, you, they, you were prepped and ready to, you're going to have to go into dialysis and they were going to take a, your kidney out or yeah. kidneys out? They were, well, they, were, they wanted to do a kidney. One doctor said that he thought I was going to have to have a kidney transplant, but I'm not ready for that. No. And uh, my doctor was very faithful to the fact that this is going to get better and yeah. we have to wait. Yes. We just have to wait it out. And she was right. We waited it out and it was great. But yeah. there was a point, I, uh, re, uh, re uh, state that fact where they were getting ready to do something and they came running in. Stop, wait a minute. Uh, wait. That was in New York, yeah. They oh, were okay. They give me a port. Oh, f- a port to, a port to prepare you for dialysis. For dialysis. Okay, they yeah, that's They thought right. I was going to have to go twice or three days a week. Oh, God. And uh, they looked at the numbers that morning just before he stuck the needle Jeez. in my arm to, to put me to sleep. And the doctor come running in and said, stop, stop. Don't, don't do, do that it. to him. Just send him back upstairs. He's fine. His numbers are good. Oh, jeez. That was another godsend. Because yeah, because. I, I prayed and prayed and prayed for that one because I, I was so tired of getting pro- poked and prodded. And What's that. the chance of that and getting those numbers right before they're getting ready to cut you I open? and put it? <laughs> A lot of things came together. Yeah. Right. As, as they say now with unbelievers, right, they think things are falling apart. Actually, things are coming together. Right. That's so, right. That's and right. things came together without your faith. Do you think this would have been a, a whole lot tougher? Or oh, I mean, I could have never gone through yeah. it without without the Lord. There, yeah. There's no way. Yeah. Just just the psychological end of it was just just a psycho. Yeah. And he was just there every day. And the people around me every day were praying. And I could actually feel those prayers. Yeah. Every single day. You could feel it. Yeah. Wow. It was really amazing. Jeez. That is uh, amazing. And so what kind of uh, do they tell you you should be doing this for physical rehab or you don't do this much or. They want you to walk, or what is the... They want me to walk a little bit, but for the most part, to do whatever I used to do is okay. more than enough. Yeah. And I do a lot of walking at the church that I work yeah. at, and I do a lot of walking uh, at home. Yeah. And, um, you know, I still mow the lawn and do all that, and uh, that's exercise for me, too. And so. they say that's all right. Just, yeah, keep doing a normal fine. life thing. Yeah. Wow. So the really... No restrictions, really. No, I went to rehab here when I got home for, for yeah. about two months, too. And they worked on it, too. And the most thing that I do at home is maybe on the treadmill every once in a great while. Yeah. I get on the treadmill. And they they told me just to do like 10 minutes at a time. Yeah. And just easy. Yeah. Know? Or take the dog out for a walk yeah. or whatever the case may be. Yeah, that's good. But, yeah. Yeah, there's no restrictions on anything. In fact, I asked my wife, um, I asked my doctor. Yeah. That uh, people were telling me not to eat pasta. And I yeah. love pasta. Yeah. And that's my favorite food. And she said, who told you that? And I said, well, everybody says you're not supposed to eat pasta because of the carbs. He says, yeah. She says, you eat as much pasta as you want. So she's trying to make me stronger. That's great. Yeah. And she's she, she does yeah, a good awesome. job at that. And so the Flower City chaplaincy.org that's where they can go if someone wants to get trained they can go to there and you'll train people once a week it's for 12 weeks it's in person and you now have the rochester police department in new york the chief of police is a chaplain yes he is he is and how did that come to be he asked to to have a he couldn't come to the night programs so we made up a program for him and the deputy chief on wednesdays during the day We'd go down to his yeah. office in his conference room, and uh, we'd pray, and then we'd uh, we'd have that session for them. Yeah. And there was like three or, f- three or four of us that taught him certain sections. Oh, my God. And it was good. It was really nice. Yeah. And so, uh, boy, I was so happy to hear that now you, you've been really, when you show up at scenes, that you're, you're welcome with open arms. There's no really pushback by the police officers are just fantastic with us. Yeah. The city police officers really accept us, and uh, they're they're helpful. They're very helpful at the scenes. They're very helpful when we show up, and uh, they know that we're a deterrent 
to anybody that wants to bother them. Yeah, right. You, you can actually you, distract or... That's right. Yeah. De-escalate so. certain people. The family gets very family. emotional. Yeah. Like you were saying, and I, and I had this in L.A., things are happening, these drive-bys happen at people's houses. Yeah. So now you got family members interjecting into a scene or trying to interfere with maybe a body or someone who's injured. Right, and it's hard to do that work. Yeah. When you have people looking over your shoulder. So we, we kind of separate that, and we, yeah. you know, we've developed good... Yeah. Uh, good techniques to be able to yeah. de escalate people and stuff like that. What helps really is when they see that chaplain name on yeah. your garment or your That's right. or whatever. Then they come running to you. And yeah, they, they know, know that you're a representative of the Almighty God. So, yeah. And you can pray with them. What's on the uniform that shows you're a chaplain? Just a, as a rocker bar or rocker? No, we just, we, just, we just wear uh, t shirts, sweatshirts. Okay. Let's say chaplain in the front and then a big chaplain in the back. Oh, okay. So, so can identify everybody you. knows who you are. Yeah, we got that on our coats for the wintertime and things like that. Oh, my God. Yeah. But there are some officers who are chaplains too, right? They're, yes. out, they're officers. I yes. mean, they're on the scene. Yeah, we have about four or five of them right now. And they can they have something on their uniform, I'm sure, yeah. right? Or a little yes, cross? Yes, they or... have a little cross on their uniform. Oh, that's cool. They're, yeah. They're chaplains. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. So... Was that already, when you came in, had they already been used to you guys being around and they accepted you already? Or is that something you had to hurdle through? Or? Well, we, we had to kind of hurdle through it. And what we did was, what we do and continue to do now is we have lunches for all the sections at certain times of the summertime. Oh, that's great. We, have, we call them cookouts or picnics yeah. where they can come by and have free food. And uh, then we get to know them. We leave our cards with them and they get to know us and who we are. Of course, it helps me a lot because my son Greg. Your is, son is on the job. He's a police police officer, and he's a Christian yeah. young officer. Yes, he is. He yeah. Is. yeah, I think that's great. That's like team building, right? You guys getting together in a non-work environment. You're you're sharing food and breaking bread, and then when you show up at the scene, you're not a stranger anymore. Right. You're a friendly face that I, right. I I sat down with. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's a good uh, that's a good philosophy to have yeah. to build really the trust is. of the department. And so, man, that's good. And how many chaplains do you have? Uh, we have a good, well, that are active. We have probably around 10 or 12. We have a total of 18, I think, right That's now. great. Yeah. Oh, my God. Now, your Flower City chaplaincy, and not only for the RPD, but from the Monroe County Sheriff's Department, too. Yes. Monroe County has a different uh, vision of this. They have volunteers that are actual chaplains. And uh, I'm a chaplain for the sheriff's office, too, because yeah. that's where I came from. Yeah, yeah, yeah you worked and there. And then we, we all, Flower City Chaplain Corps, goes in and ministers to the jail deputies. Ah, uh, yeah. Because they're a separate bunch, and they're, they need it. They, they need really it, they because really it's do. day in and day out yeah. dealing like with a— like 25 years in jail. So. Yeah, you're actually <laughs> serving time, at least yeah. eight hours of your day. You're locked in. And it's rough. And yeah, we try to we try to help them to avoid suicide, yeah. suicide prevention, uh, keeping their families together, um, things of that nature that would happen normally to officers yeah. with, uh, you know, with a lot of time on, or that see bad things they don't know how to deal with it. And uh, from what I understand, I learned that uh, PTSD makes a point. There. Yeah. And we know that the medication for PTSD is for them to talk. Yeah. And to just talk it right out. Yeah. And uh, we try to do the best I can, best we can to do that. And they can, the reason it's a chaplaincy is because chaplains are considered clergy in New York State. Oh, okay. And we have that clergy client type of confidentiality. Yeah. And no, no chaplain could ever repeat what he hears from one of the officers. Right, okay. You know, there's like an ethical. Yeah, they're uh, different. You know, the difference is they have they have peer counselors, which is good. Yeah. And I, I really my hats are off to the peer counselors. But the fact of the matter is you might be talking to a peer counselor that's um, they're going for the same job that you are in a promotion. Yeah. So you're competing against each other. So yeah. Why would you go and tell that person that you're having problems? with? No, you wouldn't do it. With alcohol. Yeah, because you know, or something like that. Yeah. What and I don't know the, the definition I was seeing was that it's a, a clergy a chaplain is a clergy for really a private organization or a private in yes. other words a business maybe a large business could come to you and say we want to have a chaplain for our company yes yeah, yeah. and that can happen like that and our church actually as chaplains is the people 
Yeah. And that's where our church is. Yeah. Out, outside the outside the walls. So field. You're in the field. In the field. Yeah. In the field. Yeah. I like there was a recent homicide tragedy, and then you were, so you're not only there for officers and to assist and, and be there for them, but also for the people that were involved in kind of a crisis intervention type role, right? Right. Absolutely. Yeah. And then we're, we're just starting to get uh, a little bit of uh, uh, groundwork, and we're developing the groundwork to get into the fire department in yeah. the city and the 911 center because those people are under a lot of pressure when they give calls out and things like that especially if they give a call out and an officer gets hurt yeah you know, they they carry that it's oh yes um, that. they say some of the most stress is the people yeah. that are on the radio sending officers into trouble or yep. yeah you know they're talking yeah, something happens they get, yeah you know, and then they're kind of forgotten because they are yeah yeah man but they're still carrying that home with them and, and maybe in their hearts with them so that's good that you you're uh yeah, it just reminds me that as a Christian, right, you you take care of your family and your friends and those in your circle, and when they're okay, now you reach out a little further, and then you go, you keep expanding your reach, right. and now you're doing that with the chaplaincy, right? You start yeah. here, and now we go a little further. We go, let's go to the dispatchers. Maybe we can help the fire department. And then you're expanding yeah. your reach, the job as prayer. Give me more to handle. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, I've actually started a new ministry. What? That I'm going to kick off the ground. You haven't told me Monday. this until yeah. right now on air. Uh, it's a, uh, it's called um, a heart ministry. Oh, a heart ministry. A heart ministry where I would be, I would be called for anyone that's going to have some type of a transplant. Yes. To give them some type of a light oh, at the end of the tunnel. Yeah. And to talk with them and encourage them and do all that. And uh, I just just got the cards in the mail. God, the that's day. a good idea. Yeah. I'll I, tell you why. Because you had that guy, right? You said, listen, I, I don't know how you got a hold of that one guy who, I've already been through this. I'll be there for you. And I'll, uh, you know, whatever you need. And this is what you can expect, right? And he gave yeah. you a little peace of mind. Yep. Yeah. But the and thing it is. It helped me immensely. And I know yeah. that people are looking forward to that because it's a scary thing. Yeah. And they don't know what's going to happen before or after. So this way here, I can pre present myself to them and say, look at there is light at the end of the tunnel. Yes. It'll be okay. You just got to do what the doctors tell you to do and then just follow your instructions. How did you get here from the first guy, the guy that helped you, that guy? I heard him through, uh, through the church. Okay. Or the, uh, not the church, but the uh, hospital. New York Hospital sent him over to okay, me. Okay, good. To talk with me. The uh, thing is, though, I'm, what I'm saying is, and like this is what's great for you, for the heart ministry is, so you got that guy, and now you got you, and now we have that skill to come from a place of knowledge. I was there. I know what you're thinking and going through. This, I, I'm going to help you. It's going to be okay. So now that you have that skill, why not keep applying it over and over again? That's right. And so now, that, now and when people become aware, I'm going to have a heart transplant. Oh, yeah. I got somebody for you. then, I talked with my doctor, and yeah. I asked her about it, and uh, she's a Christian yeah. doctor. And she says, I think it's the most greatest idea I've ever heard. That's what I think. And I told her, I says, I'll bring some cards in, but I have scripture on the cards. I yeah. says, is the hospital going to reject that? And she says, no, you don't work for the hospital. She says, you're a volunteer, so you can do whatever That's you want. That's right. She yeah. says, and I'll give your cards out to anybody that comes in yeah. and has heart transplant or heart problems. And uh, you know, Do you know how many they do, like in Rochester? or uh, Is there a I number? I think they do about eight or ten at Strong Hospital. A year? Yeah, a That's year. good, okay. And they do a hundred or a hundred and fifty a year. Yeah. Over at New York University. Wow. Okay. Yeah. 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 They are definitely the epicenter of transplants. Yeah. There's no doubt about so it. So you can and you can train people, right? To, so it's like someone who, like you've already gone through it. So now you got somebody else. You'll take them with you, maybe when you go and you talk to somebody yeah. about her. You know. Yeah. That's, yeah absolutely. Yeah. So will you just be you'll just be recruiting people that have had a heart transplant though they'll be the only chaplains or or no? <clears throat> no, that's that's correct. I mean, the, just the heart transplants will start at the hospital. Yeah, the hospital, but that'll be something separate from the chaplaincy. Yeah, but will the chaplains for the for the heart ministry that have had to have a heart transplant to be? There is none. Just me. Just you, yeah. <laughs> Just me. So that's what about the next guy? He I'm won't have only, to have a heart transplant. No, and I'm the only one in the ministry. So yeah. It oh my God. Yeah, it's good. just it's just starting. It's just yeah, starting yeah. To get off I think it's a great thing. Yeah. It's just being of service. 
Yeah, some of people. these guys, they just want, some of these people, they just want a phone call. Yeah. And they just want to be reassured that things are, they're doing the right thing, yeah. that things are going to be all right, you know. Yeah, because they don't think it's going to be all right. I mean, they can yeah. talk to the doctor, but sometimes you don't trust the doctors and what they're telling you, you know, because they make big money doing this stuff. Yeah. You know, and some people are a little bit apprehensive of, of, of dealing it with like that. And as you and I know, just being in the police field, and I always talk about this, especially being around L.A. gang members who been shot up 27 times yeah. because they actually believe they're going to, yeah, I'm going to live through this and I'm going to go on to create, yeah. and police officers get shot one time and they die right. because mentally, mentally, and I'm sure yeah. going into a heart transplant, if you think in your head, I'm not going to survive this, that's going to affect your whole, yeah. the makeup of your physicality yeah, and your absolutely. health. Wow. Absolutely. So that's good. Yeah. You need to change. Oh, the, like you said, the mindset, the coach, yeah. the mind coach. And it's just to needed. show them, look, there's light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah. No that's doubt great. About it. And it gives me a good, um, a good platform to witness to people too, yes. if it happens to come up. You know. Well, and I just can't. I just can't lie to anybody. They tell me, "How did you get through all this?" And I just yeah. say, "Jesus Christ got me through." Yeah, that's God who gets got me, me through. through. It. And uh, you know, if you don't know God, then maybe you got to sit down and start yeah. thinking about it. You know. Yeah, that's great, man. Yeah. You can. Well, that's supposed to be our. That's supposed to be our commission to bring people to the gospel, right. to bring people to Jesus Christ. So here's your way in. That's right. So. Well, listen, uh, uh, thank you for your time with me today. I know we're here kind of uh, vacationing and kind of recharging, and uh, you came up to visit, but I definitely wanted to share this message, and you, we shared it to some people last night at dinner. I think it had a big impact on someone who, had, who had, heart, had a heart attack, and he was very concerned with going forward, and I think you shared some great things with him, so you're doing the same thing here, and uh, maybe we can point some people to the Flower City org is the website, and then you are at... You're at the uh, Cavalry Chapel, Rochester, New York. So yes. they have their own website and their own podcast. Yep. It's so, man, anybody yeah. in the Rochester metropolitan area, I'm talking about Tom Basile. You're going to help him out. <laughs> Tom, this has been great. And uh, listen, come back again. We'll do another episode. Thank on. you, Cliff. And thank you for having me. Ah, you I do, love you. You do a great service ah. this way. You really do. I love you. That's Tom Basile, everybody. Love you, brother. All right, man. Listen, and you know what to do. Like, subscribe, share this episode with someone who needs it. It tells the computer you're interacting with the show. They'll show it to more people. And you're going to play a part in positively impacting some other people. You know that's a great thing. I love you. See you in the next episode.